Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Brooks, and I am going to be moderating the panel today. I just want to start off by saying this is not the movie theater. When I say this is not the movie theater, what do you think I mean? Take out your phone and turn it on because you are going to get a chance to vote. If you haven't already done this, I'd ask you to go ahead and take out your phones, turn them on, put them on silent, and uh, vote on the premise as we bring up our guests to get our panel started. Thank you. While we're waiting for our esteemed panel to approach the stage, I'm going to do a little more housekeeping. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is thank the panelists for being here. It's a fantastic panel. If you were hoping for a bloodletting today, I, I hate to inform you that they were sitting together in the back of the room having a civility lunch and an exchange of ideas and being civil. So I, I hate to disappoint you, but uh, we have some thoughtful people that are here to expand our understanding of what this means. For me personally, seeing that is uh, a reminder of why I joined the Pacific Council. I was a Marine Corps officer for 21 years. I was Hatch Act restricted. I wasn't allowed to have an opinion. Um, but I was deeply involved in, in issues around international security and policy. And the Pacific Council for me was a home. It was a, a place with thoughtful people to exchange ideas. And I want to thank the Pacific Council for giving me a place to expand on the experiences that I've had. Dr. Green always says that the strength of the Pacific Council may be the members. I've heard other people say it's the programs. Uh, I might turn that around and say that in a lot of ways it's the staff because they put incredible amount of work into this and facilitating that kind of environment. So I want to thank the staff right now for putting this together. <clears throat> I also wanted to say uh, I just turned 40, so I think I'm no longer an emerging leader. But when I joined the council, uh, I was young enough and had just enough of a baby face that they allowed me to be an emerging leader. And one of the things that that also allowed me to do is participate in some of the emerging leader programs at emerging leader rates. And that comes from somewhere. That comes from the Pay It Forward program. And I know there are members in this room that contribute to that anonymously and do so generously. And I just wanted to thank everyone here that participates in supporting young emerging leaders in the Pacific Council. Before we roll into introducing the panel, I do have a confession to make. I woke up very early this morning nervous, but it was not for this. It was because I was participating in a career fair at my high school. Um, we've been doing this for five years. I'm from Sebring High School in Sebring, Florida. It's one of the poorest communities in America. It's always on the list for highest dropout rates and poverty, and it's a combination of uh, blue collar, defined benefit, rust area, retirees, migrant workers, and uh, some rural poverty in the middle of Florida. It is not Boca. And uh, we have had a, a career fair there that seeks to you know, connect people who have gone on to professional careers and sort of give them advice. So I was nervous to talk to that group and because 16 year olds are a little bit tougher than this room. So there's still a little bit uh, in my voice shaking from really having to, to, to face um, people who sometimes don't know where to go and what to do. And I think uh, populism is, is defined a lot of ways. I think uh, over simplistically, it's often defined economically and some people have <laughs> strong feelings of that as an oversimplification. And all of the isms that contribute to the big idea of what is populism are something that I've had to sort of re-engage uh, and reconsider in order to have this debate. So the opening salvo of this debate is, will populism continue its rise? Here on our talented panel, we have four folks, two against this idea that populism will continue its rise, and two for. The folks to my immediate left, your right, are Jamie Fly. Thank you for being here. Jamie is a member of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. He worked for Senator Rubio and worked on past campaigns. He has a distinguished record in the Defense Department. I appreciate you being here, Jamie. We also have Professor Colleen Graffy. If anyone participated in the Pacific Council movie night with Star Wars, there was a significant amount of uh, symbolism in that film and one of the the enduring themes of that film I, I see you nodding there melody you said it, watching star wars is one of the most important things to do to get your american citizenship um 
this idea of the student and the master. And I understand, Professor Graffy, that you were a professor at Pepperdine while this young Potowin to my right at the far stage was a student at Pepperdine Law. Is that correct? Guilty. That may be the most dramatic thing that happens on the stage today. So, uh, <laughs> Professor Graffy, thank you for being here. I'm sure it's an honor to have a student and master face off here. Uh, to my right is Professor Christopher Parker. Chris is a Navy veteran. Thank you for your service. Thank you. I am a recovering Marine, so I always appreciate <laughs> my brothers that are sailors. Uh, Professor Parker is here today from the University of Washington. Uh, he currently has a book that he has co-authored. Uh, what's the name of the book? The name of the book is uh, The Great White Hope, Donald Trump, Race and the Crisis of American Democracy. Which is available at bookstores everywhere. Not yet, not yet, 2020, uh-uh, <laughs> not yet. Hold up. And uh, last but certainly not least is uh, Essen Zafar. Uh, Essen, thank you for being here. And isn't it true that you are here in an independent capacity representing only your own views and not your employer? Yes. I just want to make sure that was clear. <laughs> Did we get that? Smooth. Thank you. So the question, will populism continue its rise? In the intro, I discussed that maybe our ideas of populism uh, may be a little more simplistic or a little more complex than we had believed. I think we are going to start with the four speaker. And the first speaker from team four is now open for the 3.30 shot clock. All right. Uh, good afternoon. I'm still on East Coast time. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you to the Pacific Council for hosting. Particular shout out to Alex, I don't know where he is, who helped put a lot of this together. So thank you, Alex. Um, if I could take all of you with me to the National Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, I think Chris and I would have an easy time winning this debate. And I know what you're thinking. Here goes another debate, and he's opening up with Nazis, and that's not what I'm doing. What I want to do is take you to the fourth floor, which details the rise of some of the trends that we're seeing today in the 1920s and 30s that are repeating themselves today. We're seeing a narrative of grievances. We're seeing um, a political system that uh, is unable to, to resolve or deal with those grievances. We're seeing a fragmented media landscape. Um, we're seeing rising xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment. And we're seeing, after these kind of four things, we're seeing populist leaders step in um, and take advantage of these trends. I call these my four ingredients uh, of my populism cake. And my premise is, thank you for that laugh, my premise is <laughs> that the populism, I spent a long time on that analogy, the populism cake is still rising and you can make your own conclusions about the premise and the cake rising. Um, so I, you know, I define populism and, and my debate partner will challenge some of our conceptions about what populism is, but for the sake of simplicity, I define populism as a movement of the people against kind of an entrenched and disinterested elite that is unable to respond to their needs. And if people are getting what they want through the economic, social, and political landscape, they have no reason to be upset, uh, but that's not the case. Um, Many of these grievances relate to a lack of social services or um, the demise of unions uh, or income inequality that is persistent despite um, other kind of economic trends. Um, and when they, despite, when they try to resolve these issues through a political system, they're met with a political system that's not either representative of their needs or where their vote doesn't count. Um, and this is best exemplified by the refrain, I have a vote, but not a voice. And you see these trends rising as well uh, in Europe and in and the United States where political engagement is, is, is down. And so lacking a political avenue to resolve these grievances, you find people um, watching more politicized television or engaging in siloed media online. And these kind of disengagement trends are rising as well because media companies don't really have an incentive to move outside of siloed media because siloed media is loyal media and loyal media generates profits. Um, so angry, upset, and afraid, uh, many of these people find targets um, in immigrants. Uh, other minorities, the LGBT community in particular, is experiencing a lot of violence worldwide. Anti-immigrant sentiment is up. Uh, hate crimes are rising. So these trends are also rising. And in this kind of crucible, you see populist leaders step in. 
and they take advantage of these trends and they offer simple solutions to complex problems, but these, prop these solutions are illusory. And this is, you see this on the left and the right. And the rise of populist leaders is also going up. European parties uh, that are populist have doubled since 2000, um, and their share of the vote has increased dramatically. Last 10 so, seconds. Last sentence. So, my last sentence is? Last 10 seconds. Sorry. Last 10 seconds, okay. You sound like you're going to the plane. I don't want to okay. interrupt you. My, so my premise basically is um, that the populism cake is still baking, uh, and it's not quite ready to eat just yet. What a delicious intro. <laughs> Thank you, Essen. Uh, every good opening statement deserves a response. I'm going to defer now to the team against. Thank you also to the Pacific Council and to all the staff. When it comes to discussions about populism, I know that one man comes to mind, the T word. Yes, of course, I'm referring to Tiberius Gracchus, <laughs> <laughs> the second century Roman populist and reformist politician. Tiberius thought it would be a good idea to transfer land from wealthy patrician landowners to poorer citizens. He was very popular with certain groups until he was murdered. Has populism continued on its rise since then? No. Populism comes and goes, and I would argue that populism is not like a contagion that spread with a sneeze. It requires a unique formula and precise alignment of the stars and the moon in each country. Nothing about it is inevitable. Yes, social media, Russian trolls, the echo chambers of niche media, yes, they have played their role, but even these things can and are being tackled. Populism defined as the revolt of ordinary people against overbearing and self-serving elites has many causes. Sometimes it's economics. Andrew Jackson's feud with the Second Bank of the US, William Jennings Bryant's crusade against the gold standard, in Brazil today, it's corruption and economics. In Europe, after receiving the largest share of immigrants, 76 million, it's immigration, where mainstream politicians have failed to hear their citizens' concern. There has been a rise of populism that is then fanned by political entrepreneurs. Those countries that manage immigration and integration better and have confident and engaged leaders have not seen the rise of in this populist anger. Think Canada, think Ireland. Brexit is often referred to as an example of Britain having gone all populist on us, but the decision to have a referendum on Brexit was not due to populist demand. It was the decision of one man on one day Prime Minister David Cameron in 2012, against the advice of his cabinet, decided to have an in or out vote on the EU, not to quell populist demands, but to quell segments within his own conservative party. It wasn't necessary. The Brexit referendum created an accidental opening and the refugee issue gave it legs. What if Cameron's government had run a better, a better campaign? What if Boris Johnson, who was against Brexit before he was for it, what if he had not jump, jumped in and supported it for opportunistic reasons? A lot of what ifs, there was nothing inevitable about it. To conclude that populism will continue its rise is to conclude that we are incapable of addressing the perceived fears of our citizens, that we are incapable of producing leaders who are just as articulate and charismatic as the demagogues, and that our institutions are so weak that an independent judiciary, legislature, or media will crumble before the here today, gone tomorrow populace. I'm not willing to conclude that. A strongly worded response that echoes the culture club. It comes and goes, it comes and goes. <laughs> Professor Park, <laughs> you just wait for it. Yeah, you, you hear it now. <laughs> Professor Parker, would you like to respond? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, it's really nice to be here. It's coming home for me and uh, my partner here. We're both uh, UCLA grads, so Go we Bruins. went to school right down the street. Our football team sucks, but that's not where we're going right now. 
So um, I'd like to respond by saying, uh, I'm going to ask a clearly rhetorical question. What did the Know Nothing Party of the 1850s, the Klan of the 1920s, the John Birch Society of the 1950s, the Tea Party movement, and as well as the Trump movement have in common? I would argue that they have four things in common. The first of, what, the first of which is they're about the contraction of small d democracy, not the expansion of small d democracy. Two, if we follow the demographic trends, and I know this is going to be an indictment to all you white men out here, but I'm going to say it, right? White, male, middle class, or better off, uh, used to be Protestant, now Christian, um, straight, native born. That's it. If you look at all of these movements I just mentioned, right, they are instantiated and started by, I'm not saying this is a categorical assertion, it is a probabilistic assertion. Right? That is to say, more likely than not, it is that demographic that is going to push for this kind of movement. Right? And they t it tends to correspond with perceived rapid social change. Right? And I, I, can, I don't want to go into the laundry list right now, um, but what I will say is that there is always this temporal element. Think about it like this. Right? America's changing too fast. Rapid social change. And so therefore, with the Tea Party, it was take our country back back in time or from whom, it really doesn't matter. These are functionally equivalent terms, right? And then, I won't even call him President, number 45, right? Make America great again, right? Again, another temporal reference. And furthermore, these are not even conservatives qua conservatives, right? Conservatives tend to be historically very pragmatic, right? Not necessarily idealistic, they're very pragmatic which is to say that they're open to compromise. If we think about the conservatives even of the 1950s and early 1960s, think about Eisenhower. I mean, think about, uh, I'm not gonna say Goldwater because he's an example of the, an opposite kind. Think about Eisenhower, <laughs> think about uh, Mitt Romney's dad, right? Think about uh, Governor Scranton and Pennsylvania back at, in, the, in the day, and also think about Nelson Rockefeller, right? These were all moderate to quote unquote liberal conservatives. And what that means is they are open to compromise. Even Reagan was open to compromise, right? That's not what we see nowadays with these quote unquote populists, right? That's not what we see. So what happens is, is when it comes to regular conservatives, more moderate or establishment conservatives, they're okay with change. They don't necessarily like it, but they're okay with it. Um, and to, quote, to uh, paraphrase Michael Oakeshott, this a British conservative thinker, he says conservatives are okay with change so long as it's productive, right? Whereas if you look at these more reactionary kinds of conservatives, they're not okay with change at all. They see change as subversive, right? And so therefore it's very difficult for them to compromise and lo and behold, that's what we see often. So I'm actually gonna close a little earlier than my colleagues have uh, and I'm just gonna say, and I'm gonna challenge this whole notion of populism as it's called right now, because I don't think it's populism. I think it's closer to nationalism. And quite frankly, in the American context, I think it's closer to white nationalism. Thank you, Professor Parker. Based on the way that you were interacting with Jamie earlier, I just yeah. couldn't help but feel when you talked about that pragmatic, thoughtful person you were talking about, Jamie Fly. <laughs> so, Jamie, uh, that is your opportunity for uh, your opening remarks. Great. Uh, thank you, and thanks to the Pacific Council for organizing this. Uh, I was thinking about it on the way out last night that we don't have debates much in Washington anymore, at least the think tanks. I don't know if that's because of the current populist protest culture, but I'm glad the Pacific Council is, is keeping the tradition alive. Um, so I was struck by the opening statements, and since I'm going last, I'll maybe reflect on them briefly. The reality is here, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement on this stage. Uh, we have one of our opponents who argues that we're not in a populist mo moment, that there are other things. Uh, underway, but uh, Essen, even as in his initial statement, I think highlighted a lot of the concerns that I believe both Colleen and myself share about this populist moment. I guess it just comes down to whether we're more optimistic about whether it's going to collapse eventually or whether it's going to continue to rise. I sum up, sum up briefly my reasons why I think we're going to see an end to this populist moment sooner rather than later. Uh, I have three. The first is that populism often leads to false saviors. And I'm not just talking in the current American context of Donald Trump. I, you know, this has been an issue uh, for centuries in the US political system. Alexander Hamilton wrote about this in uh, Federalist 67, saying, quote, talents for low intrigue and the little arts of popularity may alone suffice to elevate a man to the first honors of a single state. And that was what drove in part the way that uh, the Founding Fathers developed our Constitution with a system of checks and balances to limit the damage if we did have a populist uh, who rose to the presidency or to other high political office. 
We've seen this even before Donald Trump and the Republican Party, and I'm speaking as a Republican, uh, looking back at what we've gone through in the last several years. Uh, we had uh, the so-called summer of discontent in 2010 in response to President Obama's health care initiatives, uh, which built on a lot of the uh, frenetic activity related to the Tea Party, and uh, it, which it was in response to the financial crisis. That led to Republicans taking the House in 2010, which we've now had control of for eight years, the Senate uh, in 2014, where I spent uh, much of the last six years working. Uh, what have we gotten out of that? Well, Republicans have often suffered uh, an inability to even do the basic things required of government, passing uh, spending bills, keeping the government uh, funded. Uh, and so you know, this inability to deliver, again, is not just a challenge the current occupant of the White House faces. It's been faced by populists who have been elected to the legislative branch. Uh, the second concern I have, and the reason I think that populism uh, is, is not going to last that long, is it leads to short-termism, which is really damaging to our country. We have significant challenges, both domestic and foreign, uh, that we're unable to address uh, if we're all uh, divided in our own corners, unable to tackle uh, things like the, the problems in our immigration system, the changing nature of our economy, uh, increasing urban and regional divides, uh, and as I said on the foreign policy front, uh, a situation where we have peer competitors unlike uh, we've had in recent decades. Um, finally, populism creates vulnerabilities that others exploit. Uh, it's not just that we also often have false saviors uh, at home, but we also have foreign challengers as we've now seen from 2016. We have a Russian government which exploited our societal divisions in a very sophisticated way using social media. Uh, and with China as a peer competitor looming in the future, that's only going to be a greater challenge going forward. Thank you, Jamie. Before we enter into the response round, I have a little more housekeeping. If everyone had a chance to vote, I'm going to go ahead and publish the initial uh, take from the audience. Alex, do you have that? No pressure. I would love to hear it. Seventy-nine percent of the audience believes that populism will continue its rise, and twenty-one percent believe that it will not. Is that correct? All right. Well, the goal of this is to have a, a, an exchange of ideas and push the needle. So if the needle moves above 80, then this side has uh, brought its ideas to bear and, and won your support when we vote at the end. And if we move back, under 79%, this side will have won. Wait, wait, hold, oh, wait, hold, hold, hold up. 80%? <laughs> what are we a doing here? 80% is, 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 is movement. No, we... Okay, I thought it was like 51, 49. No, this, this, yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, if it's, it's over, if you want to go home, we can get you a to-go <laughs> meal and <laughs> comp everything, validate your parking. <laughs> okay. Since... Uh, we are going to reverse position. Uh, this gives you an opportunity to close. Uh, so on, in the opening remarks, uh, uh, this side got to go last. Um, for, the, for the response round, you'll get to go last. Okay. So the first response will come from the against side of the room. Um, speaker one, feel free to respond. Oh, okay. Well, I was intrigued that so much of what was said was that it's all about the right, that it's a problem of this right populism. And as we've discussed, it's something that Democrats need to be very careful of because there is a rise of populism on the left. Bernie Sanders challenging Hillary Clinton. We know that in countries in Latin America, Hugo Chavez was a populist. Now Maduro is a populist. And when populist governments have taken root, they will either solve the problem and moderate, in which case they're no longer populist, or they realize that there are rarely simple solutions to complex problems and also moderate. The only other choice is to turn authoritarian, as we've seen in South America. In either case, they're no longer populist. I think there's a, a real danger if we assume that the rise of populism is inevitable, because it means that those individuals on the extreme from either side who feel that they're not being heard manage through a articulate individual to come to power 
what is it that they do? They then immediately turn around and say, our view is the 100% right view, and all the others are marginalized, and we will listen to no one else. This is doing exactly what brings the populist anger to rise, and it will then repeat itself. So I go back again that if we look in each country, we see a specific wrong that the people feel need to be right. And if the government is incapable of responding to that, then this can take hold. Immigration, for example, those of us, I lived in London, you couldn't talk about immigration. It was seen, you were seen as being racist, but it was a real problem. And it was only was uh, when Nigel Farage, the very charismatic individual, UKIP, spoke about it, that it got so much attention that politicians too late started to sit up and take notice. Look at Japan, where there's been no history of populism. There's also very little immigration. And so when we look from country to country, it's sui generis, it's not automatic, and I think we should take into consideration that it is not an automatic contagion that will spread. We have, we have power over this, we don't need to surrender. Professor Graffin, in your opening remarks, you gave us some historical perspective, and in your response, you gave some global perspective. Thank you. Response? Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, first, it doesn't matter if it's left-wing or right-wing populism. Populism is populism. It expresses itself differently, as Professor Graffy mentioned, but my point is that populism is rising. So whether it's rising on the left or right, the contention here is that it's rising. And there's some confusion here, so I want to reset expectations. The idea isn't that um, populism will collapse eventually. Yes, the cake will get eaten. Okay, so <laughs> populism will eventually collapse. Absolutely. But the, 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 tr the premise here is that populism is rising or will rise. And our contention is that this, whether you call it populism or reactionary politics, this movement is on the rise. Nothing that uh, my esteemed uh, opposition has said tells me anything about the trends that I outlined. None of those trends are on the decline, right? Hopefully one day we would all want those trends to be on the decline, but nothing that I've heard shows that. Um, nor have the populists been in power long enough uh, for people to actually see that most of them are filled with hot air. Right? That takes a little bit of time. And um, you know, we're not arguing that populism won't die eventually, just that right now it's not on its deathbed. Okay, right now it's rising. And there's a danger in this, right? Because um, populism can be a powerful force uh, for reforming politics, for getting um, the people of, of a nation closer to uh, their needs. But populism unchecked, irrespective of its political flavor, populism unchecked can be very dangerous. And to ignore uh, that is to ignore it at its peril. And moreover, to ignore the underlying trends. We want a political system that's not post-democratic, that's representative of people's needs. We want um, um, a, a, a narrative that, uh, where the grievances at least have some kind of outlet. We don't want a situation where the media is being fragmented. Um, so the other thing I will add that I come to this from a perspective of having seen a lot of this on the ground. Uh, after uh, Brexit and the presidential election, I held 38 separate uh, meetings um, uh, with a number of people from all sides of the political spectrum, and we issued a report, which I'm happy to share with you at some point, um, that sh highlights some of these trends uh, in even greater detail. Um, and nothing I've seen uh, shows that these trends are on the decline. The cake is being baked, the cake is cooling, the cake will be sliced. Listen, I'm going with it, yeah. the cake analogy. <laughs> uh, Jamie, a response from your side. Yeah, to, to adopt the, the cake analogy, I mean, I, think, I guess the difference here is that we agree the cake is rising, but we believe it's going to collapse before we can eat it, uh, essentially. And so um, I think it comes down to twist. our view that populism clearly does not work. I think you can see this not just in the U.S. context. Um, yes, we're only two years into the presidency of Donald Trump, uh, but we've had populist movements underway uh, for quite some time in Europe. There, the challenge many European populist parties face, uh, because there you do have parties that actually are populist rather than populist capturing political parties, like is what has had, had to happen here in the US. There, it also leads to gridlock. There, you have populist parties that the mainstream parties will not cooperate with, will not form coalitions with. Um, and you basically have situations where you have minority governments 
that also are very limited in their ability to deliver for citizens. And so I think our view is that those fundamental dy dynamics, whether it's a political system where you don't even have a government that can function and uh, do things in response to these very real demands that the people have, or here in the U.S. context where it's led to increased polarization, uh, which has been described in both our media culture, our political, political culture, it will not uh, result in uh, the developments that the people want to see. Um, I think those who support populists uh, here in the U.S., whether it's on the left or the right, are going to end up uh, sorely disappointed. Uh, they're going to realize that the, the figure, whether it's the congressman or the president, uh, that they place so much hope in, uh, is unable to deliver any more than their predecessor. Um, as I said, I'm a Republican, but I'm not, a, not a Trump Republican, but I have extended family members who supported uh, Donald Trump, and as one said to me a couple months ago, uh, as we discussed some of the challenges the president was having in implementing his agenda, uh, his response was, well, if Donald Trump, of all people, can't change Washington, then who can? And I think that's the challenge that people are going to face. And so they're going to look at that lack of results, uh, and the best case uh, for people like my family member uh, who said this is going to, is going to be that they're going to disconnect from the political system, uh, have increased apathy about the political system. In the worst case, uh, in societies, it leads to civil strife and potentially violence, as we've seen with some of the current protest culture. And so I think at the end of the day, as we're starting to see here in the U.S. and we've seen in Europe, we're going to see these populists fail, and the voters are going to have to respond and end the populist moment. So to be clear, the cake is not a cake at all, but a souffle that collapses on itself. <laughs> we can well, turn we the oven off. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we save the best for last. Professor Parker, you get to close with the response round. Yes, thank you. Um, so what I will say is that, so our opponents, our esteemed opponents argue that, um, forget about the cake analogy, right? I'm, I'm tired of that one. <laughs> I thought you were on our, my team. Nah, man, I'm trying to look good, man. I'm not trying to eat cake. Anyway, so, so, um, so think, about, think about the populism, right? So I just mentioned, so our esteemed colleagues suggest that populism is not on the rise. And, I'm not sure I agree with that. In fact, I don't, otherwise I wouldn't be on this side. So what I want you to do is take note of the cycles that I mentioned earlier. First, the Know Nothing Party of the 1850s, Klan of the 1920s, the John Birch Society, the Tea Party, and now Trump supporters. This is a cyclical thing, you guys. It always happens. So even if it does go into decline at some point, which it often does, it's just gonna come back once again once there's this perception among the demographic group that I mentioned earlier that, hey, somebody is stealing our country from us. We want our country back. And this, I would argue, has not only happened here in the United States, and uh, Professor Graffi says this is not sui generis, right? Um, or it is sui generis. Um, it is not sui generis. If you look at what, what connects Europe and the United States, is that there's a sense of rapid social change. In the United States, it's also about immigration, but it's also about the increasing visibility of, especially nowadays, of women you know, in powerful positions, right? It also has to do with the increasing visibility of same-sex rights. This is not all about race. I wanna make that very clear. This is about gender, this is about culture, this is about um, gender culture, this is about nativity, immigrants, right? This is about all of these things put together. And what do they have in common? It's, it has in common this idea of what America should be, right? And what is no longer the case, and they wanna go back to that. It's the same thing in Europe. They're saying similar things. You know, France or social welfare in France, according to the Front National, I think they have a new name now, I forgot what it is, should be for real Frenchmen. You have a right-wing party that, that is actually approaching power in Austria. You, we, hope, we know what just happened in Italy. You have alternative for Deutschland in Germany that's about to push Merkel out. These things are all reactions to the same phenomena, just a different context. Right? I, I want to make this clear. So populism, if you want to call it that, is not on the rise. Is, is not, not only on the rise, but it's going to be it's, it's cyclical, but it's never going to go completely away. The last thing I want to say is, to the extent that populism, qua populism, is about economic anxiety, right? Uh, it, we think about the 48% of college-educated whites that voted for Trump. We think about the two-thirds of Trump supporters during the primary that were in the upper half of the income distribution. This is not about economic anxiety. I don't care what they want to sell you. This is not the case. Thank you, Professor Parker. So we had our introduction. We had our initial poll. We had our opening remarks. 
We had our response round, and I feel like I have the best seat in the house. I've got to see furious note-taking on both sides, <laughs> um, some thoughtful and emotional responses. I enjoy them both. Uh, but when I sit here, I see people taking notes and looking, and now it is our turn to turn the microphones out to you. So we will open for 20 minutes for audience questions. We have some runners with microphones uh, that will bring them to you. Uh, I see heads going up and down. I see heads going back and forth. Are there any opening questions? It looks like we have questions, a, a, and, comments. A, uh, questions and comments. Uh, there's a woman in the back in the center and there's a gentleman up front. Let's start with the woman in the back, please. Hi, thanks for your comments. If populism is cyclical, has it always been so globally coordinated? If you could take us back through some of the previous trends, was it because there was no internet and communication didn't flow as freely then that they weren't as, it just seems like it's, it's everywhere right now, but take us through some of those other periods, please. So I think that's directed at me perhaps. So um, I'll, I'll take that one if you guys don't mind. So if we think about, if we think about the I don't even include the clan of the 19th century, really, because that was a, because what my partner and I did, not this partner, but my co-author in a Tea Party book we wrote, we only examined like these right-wing movements at the national level. So the clan of the, of the 19th century didn't, doesn't qualify as such, but the clan of the 1920s does, right? And this was a reaction to the quote unquote new Negro returning from World War I, the increasing liberalization of women's rights. Think about what was happening in the 1920s. You also think about you know, how uh, the Klan thought about you know, how capital was, was the preserve of Jews. You, you have anti-Catholicism. You have this pushback against all these sort of cultural changes, right? So, and that was clearly way before, you know, the internet, because we're talking about the 1920s. The 1950s and early 1960s was about the John Birch Society, and some of, I can just see by a few gray hairs out here, some of you guys were alive and kicking in the 1960s and can perhaps recall the John Birch Society, whom, um, whom, oh, what's my man's name? The guy who founded, uh, um, not the Weekly Standard, um, uh, but Bill Buckley. Bill Buckley Jr. essentially wrote the John Birch Society out of the conservative movement because they were far too way outside of beyond the bounds and, and beyond the pale, right? They were just too reactionary, right? But that was a response to the civil rights movement, right? So they thought that people like Ike um, and Earl Warren, because of the decision on uh, their opinion on Brown v. Board of Education, that they thought they were in cahoots. So you have this conspiratorial discourse that surrounds us as well, right? They thought they were in cahoots with the Soviet Union. Now we march forward to the Tea Party, we remember who they were, and now with Trump. So now these latter periods with Trump clearly and the Tea Party, uh, excuse me, and the Tea Party, you know, we have the internet, but these people were organizing way back then right, in the 1920s, all the way through the 1950s and 60s without the benefit, you know, and the proliferation of social media. So and it was all about this reaction to rapid social change, right? And so and you didn't need to be in the same specific location. The decline of the 1920s, transgr it was beyond the South. You had, clan, you had clan memberships, you had clan parties in Buffalo, New York, all the way to Oregon, right? It was all over the place. So, and this is without, now you did have media in the sense that they had, uh, you know, a magazine that everybody read, and this harkens back to just really quickly, uh, this uh, guy named Benedict Anderson who wrote a book called, way 1993, called Imagine Communities. So people don't need to be in the same physical location to feel part of an imagined community as long as it's connected in some way. Thank you, Professor Parker. We had a couple of questions. This gentleman in the hat, I think had his, uh, this fantastic hat, had his hand up next, and then... This woman right here in the front next after that. Thanks very much. Um, Southern politics, uh, I'd like to bring in that dimension here. The old Southern Democratic Party knew how to, of elites, knew how to control the non-elites, whether they were black or white, mm -hmm. fairly well, uh, if you're looking at it from that particular perspective of dominance. Um, uh, starting actually with LBJ and the uh, civil rights movement, uh, and then continued from Nixon onward, uh, the realignment of American politics that took at least three decades fully to come into bloom. You could see that, or one could see that as the South taking over the Republican Party of Lincoln, which is an interesting historical anomaly. Uh, but be that as it may, um, the, I would argue that the uh, 
earlier the Southern Democrats, now the Republican Party, maintain the, particularly the South, speaking of it as a region, not trying to be discriminatory in any way pejorative. Uh, the politics were to, con uh, they kept the balance of power arguably in American politics through the Senate and, and other means uh, with a minority position, but nevertheless able to do that. Uh, now uh, they've extended essentially not just control of the old Republican Party, which is now uh, in rural areas, uh, some of the same tactics used in the South are now used across the country in, in an amazing coalition. Um, and uh, strangely, a New Yorker uh, knows how to step in and, and uh, depend upon that apparatus. Uh, and so po the populism we see on the right is really old politics and old wine in, in new bottles in some ways. Uh, and I, I think it is ironic to have a New Yorker uh, on top of that, of that, of that heap. Uh, but be that as it may, I'd like your reaction to include, condemn everything I've just said. <laughs> if, okay, yeah, I'm, I, I think you're right on point with, with I mean, I was, I'm really impressed with your, I mean, yes, that was definitely the, uh, the point at which uh, the political parties realigned. So you had LBJ who aligned uh, the Democrat Party uh, with racial progress, and you had, um, you had Goldwater who aligned uh, the Repub Republican Party in 1964 with racial regression, right? And like you said, it took about, I'd say about 20 years for this realignment to congeal, but congeal it did. And I often have to explain to my students, they always think that uh, the Republicans are the, are the bad guys, right? I was like, uh-uh, it wasn't always that way. This is like within your parents' lifetime that the, the script was flipped. And so you guys need to be aware of that. And just one thing I want to end on on this comment is I often get these crazy hate emails, right, saying, oh, my God, you, how can you compare the Tea Party to, you know, to the Klan, right? He says, he says the Klan were, they were Democrats. And I was like, yeah, okay, I already know that, right? So, so why don't you ask me something that I don't already know? I think we have time for a couple more ahead. Uh, let's take one from this side of the room real quick, and then uh, this woman right here in the front. Yes, hi. Um, I'm here at this conference as an emerging leader, which means I'm on the younger end of the attendees. Um, and I'm curious if any of you can speak to uh, probably both sides, maybe one from each side, um, sort of the in influence of different generations on your perspective here. Um, you know, after Brexit and the, our 2016 presidential election, there was a lot of look at sort of uh, a split between older voters and younger voters and um, just sort of how you see generational divide playing that, into this. Is it directed to anyone specifically on the panel? Yeah. I, just someone on each side maybe could answer. Do you, do we, do we, no. Well, okay. Um, so I think that uh, there is a differential in the generations. I was thinking with the media question, every populist movement finds a different medium. We had yellow journalism that was looking, you know, at the rag sheets, that not the mainstream media. We had the radio being used, fireside side chats with FDR and Father Coughlin. The uh, McCarthyism was able to take hold with television, but note that it was also his downfall, television. And so now I see we all used to watch, you know, older generation, you know, ABC, CBS, it, we all watched the same news. But now with the proliferation of news channels, we are able, and media in general, we are able to basically go to our echo chamber and we just listen to the same voices that are saying the worst of the other side and the best of our own side. And I think that now Facebook, Twitter are all recognizing the damage that's being done by this. And I think young people, I teach law school students, I think they are learning to be more selective on recognizing, for example, RT is Russia Today, straight from the Kremlin, and they are wiser about recognizing the algorithms that are making decisions for them. And so I think this is something that needs to be emphasized as soon as young people become socially media aware that they do not want to be siloed. And we also need to address this with those that are running social media to say there needs to be an opt out for your creating algorithms just, that just let me speak and listen and hear and be consumed by my own, the own voices that I know. I think a generational question is a perfect bounce pass from the professor to a former student. Uh, SM, did you have something else to add to that? 
Yeah, uh, technically I'm still a millennial, so maybe I can. <laughs> that is an ever-changing definition, but I'm one of the older, elder millennial like that Netflix show. But, um, um, and I also teach students, uh, you know, so I've been kind of working on some of these issues. One thing that's interesting um, is that uh, there is a number of studies that show uh, that, you know, usually uh, age is kind of a buffer. Younger people are somehow find themselves, uh, I'm not talking about the majority, the minority, but the majority find themselves buffered against kind of rising populism. And we're not seeing that, uh, especially in Europe. We're seeing a lot of younger people are kind of getting engaged in populist moments and populist movements. Austria's prime minister is the, one of the youngest uh, uh, officials, I think the youngest prime minister elected in that country. Um, but I will say this from my perspective. I think um, the thing that's unique is that young people have now more than ever before, I think, agency. They have the ability, they have the tools to have their voice heard. Um, they have the ability to even start a movement. We've seen this after the Parkland shooting, for instance. So young people, even though um, they're also the targets of a lot of these narratives, these populist narratives, they also have a lot of agency and ability to shift those narratives um, towards something that's maybe a more productive political dialogue. I think there's an appetite for a few more questions. Uh, th this woman here has been waiting very patiently in the front row. Thank you. Um, well, I would like to be persuaded by the optimists in the panel, but, and you mentioned my questions directly for Colleen, because you mentioned that populism doesn't happen from one day to the next, that there are concrete events like the 76 million immigrants in Europe or corruption in Brazil. But I'm wondering, like, those things, the way people interpret those specific events has to do with how the media are framing them. And I'm worried about who are the owners of the media who are controlling how we end up interpreting that information. Because it doesn't seem to be a very diverse group of people. The, the owners, like, newspapers are only read by 1% of Americans. So it's really television what matters. Even Twitter doesn't have that many. Like, even if there's something amazing on Twitter, few people are really paying attention. So television, for me, I want to know what's your view of what's going to happen with the owners of, te of television if they're only very conservative, if they really only care about their point of view being disseminated. Thank you. Well, I see that, I first of all would say that television is not where everyone's getting their news. Most everyone are they're cutting the cord and they're just pulling up information from social media and that is quite empowering because it means as was said that anybody can be participating we just need to make sure that the right people not conspiracy theorists but the right people are engaged so I lament that key newspapers no longer have the funds for investigative journalism for example but then look at Bellingcat Bellingcat is the, is the nonprofit group that basically broke the story of the Skripal Russian um, Novichuk poisoning and discovered that the two Russians were not tourists going to see Salisbury Cathedral. After all, they were in fact Russian Secret Service. They did this by having committed patriotic individuals that are for democracy and for human rights and they are teaching others in, who are interested to become journal, uh, investigative journalists so that they are crowdsourcing people that will identify passports, information, where people have been, and are solving big issues like the script hole poisoning. So I have, um, the disruptor in the media has happened. You know, once uh, Craig, Craigslist came out and destroyed all of the, the um, classified ads, journalism has been bereft of the funds that they often need. But we have a new, um, a new, uh, you're giving me the time, okay, the new um, way of coming I was forward. just straightening my time. Yeah. You can okay. talk as long as you want. Is that we are empowering ourselves to be able to use social media to communicate and to inform. We just need to make sure that we help the right people and give them the right tools and have them have the right foundational education and information to be able to support our institutions and our values. Time for a couple more questions. There's one right here on this side of the room. In my opinion, with certainty, populism is on the rise. We see it in a lack of representation 
and diversity in government, the effects of laws that are not universally or equally administered, and mounting unrest in marginalized communities. Do you think that there could ever be the rise of a moderate uh, third-party platform slash ideology that encapsulates the middle-of-the-road approach to populism that better serves our democracy and citizenry, or are we too entrenched as a nation? Is that directed to this side of the room first with a, and then a response? Sure, absolutely. You want to be talked into it and then, okay, perfect. Jamie, you want to take this? So it's a, it's a good question because I think it gets to this point which some have made uh, about the notion of a, a responsible populism, essentially. I would argue, though, that at that point, if you're looking uh, to a responsible populism, you're looking at a functioning democracy. And uh, I mean, some would argue, I've heard uh, you know, Japanese friends argue that uh, Prime Minister Abe in Japan is a responsible populist, uh, and that's why they haven't seen a populist wave. I think the reality, though, is, as Colleen noted, it's more the unique nature of Japanese society, the lack of uh, issues like immigration. Uh, to, to drive a lot of the, the populist dynamic. We have another example in Europe of uh, someone who kind of rode a populist wave, Emmanuel Macron in France. The challenge he now faces, as his popularity is, uh, is not doing so well, uh, is that he's kind of blown up the political system in the process uh, of becoming president um, and disrupted uh, many political parties, actually destroyed one of them. And so there's a real question about uh, post-Macron whether he's left, whether he will have left the French political system in a more vulnerable situation, where you could have a real demagogue uh, actually get to the highest levels of French politics, which until now, as I mentioned before, in most of these European companies, uh, countries, we haven't faced this situation where we've had the populist candidate actually win and become leader, except perhaps in maybe Austria uh, and Italy now. But the the big European countries have not had the situation partly because of the, the dynamics of their coalition structures. Um, so I think at the end of the day, responsible populism is really democracy functioning effectively. Uh, and in the US case, uh, I think that part of our argument is that our constitutional checks and balances at the end of the day are gonna revert us back to a more normal politics. Um, because I think the reality is that if people, the people who supported populism, when they don't see the results, they'll either return to the fold and, and vote normally, or they'll check out of the political system, which is not a great thing, but I think it's a, a real danger in the U.S. context. Uh, Christopher, I think you want to respond to that also. Yeah, thank you. So I don't really believe there's anything, there's any such thing as responsible populism, first of all. I think if you think about populism uh, in the historical context, what happened was in the late 19th century, um, you did have um, people of color who were part of the People's Party, if you will. But then what happened was, the Democrats came in, played the race card, Tom Watson was one of them, who was actually pretty progressive, and then the Democrats put pressure on him, and then you started, they started having excluding uh, people of color. The problem with populism, qua populism, is this idea of who defines the people demographically, right? And typically, marginalized groups aren't part of the people. So let me just say that to begin with. Second part I wanna say is that there is, I think there is a way to get our country to move back, at least the United States, to move back towards the middle. And there's research that suggests that even among you know, conservatives, establishment, more traditional kinds of conservatives, if you frame progressive policy about what it is to be an American and patriotism, you can move them to the middle, right? But you have to hit them with that framing that it's all about American values and ideals. Once again, if you do that, you can, one can move enough of them more towards the middle. And so that's one way. Uh, that we can do this. Keeping an eye on time, looks like we have time for probably one more question before we enter into the conclusion uh, and the concluding statements um, for the final vote. There's a bright young law student in the front. Thank you. This is Melody. Um, since we killed the cake analogy, I'm assuming you're gluten intolerant. But speaking to... <laughs> going back to demographics, I'm actually wondering if the if you think that the demographic makeup of the panel currently is actually telling about the way we experience populism. <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that one. <laughs> Look, I, I, let me say something. I mean, I, Chris and I actually brought this up, right? So when we were preparing for this panel, I brought it up, in fact. and. And without getting too much, and it's a great question, by the way, which deserves another, um, another debate or another like panel. Um, but there is something to be said for lived experience, right? So, um, 
wait up for my conclusion, but, you know, I would wager that Chris and I have a different lived experience. I have lived the effects of at least authoritarian populism, maybe not anarchic populism, but authoritarian, or I don't like to use the word right wing, but authoritarian populism. I've lived it, not just in this country, uh, but in other countries that I've lived in. Um, and so um, coming from that perspective tinges the way I look at the future. You can call it pessimistic. I don't call it pessimistic. I think of it as uh, realistic, right? Um, so like uh, uh, Christopher was talking about the cycles, right? I, we've experienced the cycles. I've experienced the cycles. I know exactly based on personal experience where I think this cycle is. You can disagree with me, but um, that gives me an insight into saying, you know what, we haven't hit that zenith. I hope we hit it soon. I hope we develop a, a, a a ethos that is brings people together on American values and cultural values, and hopefully we will. Eventually we will, because the cake will get eaten. I'm sorry, I had to bring it up again. But um, I, think that, I think to a certain extent that's telling. Um, all that being said, I wouldn't read too much into the fact that there's two people of color on the right and two people, you know, people, I don't know, their ethnic backgrounds on the left, but I'm assuming not. Um, because there's all kinds of things and, you know, finding speakers that can come to L.A. and all this other stuff. So um, <laughs> I think Alex is the best person to respond to that. But um, I wouldn't read too much into it, but I think that uh, your question does kind of open up that space about, you know, there's a way of discussing populism academically, and then it's a very personal and emotional uh, subject as well. Thank you, Essie. Uh, Jamie, did oh. you have a response to that also? Yeah, I, I was just going to jump in briefly on... I see this, and what struck me about the conversation, actually, uh, less on the, the demographics and more on just the, the political perspective, because Colleen and I both served in a Republican administration um, over the years. I'm a lifelong Republican. I was struck because I expected a lot of the debate would actually be uh, our, some of our opponents perhaps defending progressive populism and advocating for it, because I have many friends on the left, and that's their current argument, uh, that in the, uh, the way to respond to Donald Trump is to embrace his tactics. We haven't really gotten into that debate whatsoever. Um, so uh, I won't start that debate now, but my interest in this is actually as a lifelong Republican living through my own personal experience uh, of, of the last decade. Because I think as I described several times about whether it's 2010, the summer of discontent, Tea Party uh, rise, I mean many Republicans looked at that moment and thought that this was going to be fantastic for us. Uh, we controlled uh, the Congress, now we control uh, essentially all three branches of government. Uh, and I'm sitting here as a Republican telling you to put the brakes on, that it's not all rosy and optimistic, and that there are some dangers. So that's what struck me actually about our conversation is more the left-right divide to a certain extent rather than uh, some of the other demographic issues. Colleen, I'd like you to have the last comment on this, and then we'll roll into concluding statements. Just very briefly, my life experience is living in Heidelberg, West Germany at a time when we had the wall and I brought Pepperdine students over to East Germany and to East Berlin and traveled with, through Russia, Soviet Union, and I never thought that the wall would come down. So I guess that's my life experience when I see that individuals can make a difference and being there when the wall came down and students going climbing on the wall and chipping it, that to me means that our fate is not, is not written in a wall. It is our choice, and we can make the difference. And I've seen that happen myself. Thank you, Professor Graffy. We are going to roll into concluding statements. We've had a lot of thoughtful debate and conversation. And now we are going to allow the four speaker to go first, second, third, and then last. Going first again. If you'd like to. to go first. It, I, it's I would never first. keep you from. Yeah, come on, man. <laughs> Christopher, right? I would to, love for you to go first. Trying to, trying to put the black man last. What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had to go there. That's obligatory for me. Sorry about that, you guys, for making you nervous with that. So let me say this. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so let me say this. Uh, first, uh, see, this has been wonderful, but I don't want to waste my time with platitudes, so let me get on with what I'm going to say. So um, one of the things I'd like to touch upon is um, with uh, one of our esteemed um, opponents said that, well, suggested that the Tea Party, you know, was all about or mostly about 
uh, the financial crisis and, you know, and, and was it economic uh, discipline, which is not the case at all, which uh, my colleague and I, Matt Barreto, show in our book. What we show in our book is that most of the motivation for the Tea Party was about the election of Barack Obama. Case open, case shut, right? Then that was about race and progress, first of all. Um, second of all, when it comes to um, this other notion about you know, we, us making progress, right? Like uh, Professor Jaffe, uh, Graffy said that you know, the wall came down, she never thought it was gonna come down. Okay, that's, that, that's all well and good, but that suggests that you know, we're on this inexorable march, progressive march. That is not the case. And, and frack, when I wake up every day, um, I'm just gonna say this, as a black man in 2018, I'm not sure if it's 2018 or 1918, to be frank with you. So I don't think we've made that much progress over time, right? We're actually seeing like we're going backwards in time. So I just wanted to get that off my chest, and so let me move to my concluding remarks, is that to the extent that populism is tied to uh, this notion of economic anxiety and looking at the populist or the People's Party back in the 19th century, you know, it was about, you know, the small farmers, the, the, the real Americans, if you will, or the ordinary person, they were upset because, you know, they felt like economically they were getting screwed over, they were getting a shaft. And so it is typically tied to economic anxiety. I'm not saying it's not tied to anything else, but it's typically tied to that. But if we believe that to be the case, then, then what do we make of 48% of college-educated whites voting for Trump? What then do we make of the fact that two-thirds of Trump supporters during the primary were in the upper half of the income distribution? What do we make of that? Now, the policy prescription for that would be to bring jobs back, right, and to have a better standing of living. But clearly, these people aren't worried about that. So then how do we explain this? There is no explanation beyond that which I would, I would submit that a bunch of this is about white nationalism. Not all of it, not, not, I'm not making a categorical assertion. Once again, I'm making a probabilistic assertion when it comes to this. So I'll finish on that, thank you. Thank you, Professor Parker. Thank you. We all know from science that correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. So just because nation A, C, and D have seen a rise in populism doesn't mean that ergo countries B, E, and others will see the same rise. Why? Because we're not cookie cutter countries. Each country has different issues and different potential for resolving those issues. My learned opponents talk about trends, trends. Well, there's a trend for populism to rise. There's a trend for that to happen. Trends are trends until they're no longer trends, and then they're not. So what, is a, what makes that change? It's individuals addressing, identifying first, and then addressing a trend that is not a good trend, and then doing something about it. Populists would like us to believe that this is some new metaphysical zeitgeist that we are helpless to oppose. And I would say that that's just a weak response. Once we've recognized that there's elements of populism that are not good, why don't we investigate and figure out why it's happening and what we should do about it? Immigration and, and uh, not proper integration is an issue. The EU refused to discuss it. Politicians were reluctant to discuss it. And now we have country after country where they either have real or perceived immigration issues that's going to change their identity. They have concerns and they need to be addressed. So just because Steve Bannon jets into a country doesn't mean that populists are gonna win the next election. It is not inevitable that uh, populism and this is our question, that populism will continue to rise. Populism is rising, but there is nothing that says it, it is inevitable that it will continue to rise. And we will argue that uh, we don't need to surrender to populism. It is not an inevitable, inevitable continuing rise. Thank you, Professor Graffi. Essen, your final conclusion? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I wanna bring it back, uh, and Professor Graffi helped quite a bit to this idea that this is not a normative argument we're making. We're not talking about whether populism is good, at least not here, or populism is bad, whether right-wing populism or left-wing populism. The, the, the question being put to us is, will populism continue to rise? 
we've posited, or at least I've posited, that there's a number of trends that show that it's rising. It's a pretty simple formula, right? X, Y, and Z exists. There's no signs of it going down, um, and thus populism will rise. And the, the argument the other side kind of keeps making, which is confusing for me, is ways to tackle populism or pessimism or optimism. To me, that's really irrelevant. The question is, will populism uh, continue its rise? And the overwhelming amount of data shows that it will, and this is how human beings make decisions. They look at pre-existing data, draw a conclusion. This does not mean that there's not a small chance it may not, but vast majority of the data trends in this direction. And you can look at, you know, if we're really gonna go down this uh, route, we can look at just the last two years. Uh, just last weekend in Brazil, you saw a authoritarian populist leader who was stabbed uh, make enough, get enough votes to make the runoff. Last month in September, you saw the Swedish Democrats uh, become the third largest party in Sweden. Uh, you've seen the prime minister of the Czech Republic is a far-right authoritarian uh, 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 yeah, Poland as well, thanks for that assist. Uh, okay. Viktor Orban is now the longest serving prime minister in Hungary. Um, I, you know, I could go on, we talked about Austria. Uh, in Italy you have uh, a number of populist movements and, and the, the Five Star uh, movement is the largest party in the country. Um, you know, these do not sound like the dying gasps of a populist moment. They sound like populism is on the rise. And to go back to your question, you know, I'm a refugee to the United States. So I, I was a refugee from the Persian Gulf War. There's always a Persian Gulf War, but the one in 1990. Um, and, and the reason why it's important for us to recognize that populism is on the rise, because if we don't, you end up seeing the end results of something when an authoritarian populist leader, for instance, becomes a dictator, um, and you see what happens when something like that happens. I went through refugee camps in different countries. And so my last point, my last 10 seconds um, is to say all of this, why is all of this important? It's important because we have a number of leaders here today and we need to think critically about, you know, it's one thing to say populism is on the rise, but now we need to think about what can we do based on those trends that we saw, political representation, xenophobia, what can we do to assess and ameliorate those trends? How can we curb this rising tide of populism? Thank you. Thank you, Essen. Jamie, your concluding statement. Great. Um, so I just want to pick up actually where Essen just left off. I mean, I think the, he was framing this as a discussion about whether populism is on the rise. Well, I think the, the question is actually, will that continue? Uh, certainly over a certain uh, recent period, populism has been on the rise, but I think our argument is that it's un, this is uh, fundamentally unsustainable. Go back to, uh, you know, there's all kinds of definitions of populism. I think the one that has struck me is uh, support for ordinary people. That's often what drives these movements. I think if you just look at recent populist developments, whether it's in the U.S. or in Europe, do ordinary people feel that their populist support is working out for them? Are they better off uh, than when they went out and supported a populist in the first place? And I think in most of these countries, you would find continued frustration. You would find people are not happy. Here in the U.S., whether it's on the left or the right, even uh, you know, many Trump supporters, I think, are frustrated about his inability to deliver on fundamental promises. Uh, I don't think the wall has been built yet. There are many other challenges that uh, he faces on a regular basis, dealing with uh, entrenched opposition in Washington. And on the left, the opposition to Trump has caused people to go out in the streets. Uh, and we've seen a protest culture develop, unlike anything I've ever seen in 20 years in Washington. Uh, we've had uh, senators chased out of restaurants with their, their wives. I, I actually was behind Senator Cruz at the TSA checkpoint in Washington last night. Uh, he was looking over his shoulder constantly, looking like he was waiting for someone to come harass him. Uh, that's not a sustainable situation for any vibrant democracy uh, when you have that sort of protest culture result. And so I think the danger of uh, adopting our opponent's framing uh, is if you think that this is just the trend, then if you're the opposition, you should develop the same, adopt the same tactics. And I think that's a very dangerous situation, uh, whether it's the Democratic Party in the age of Trump, uh, or whether it's those uh, centrist voices in Europe who are trying to figure out how to deal with uh, the populist movements in their countries. And so I think at the end of the day, our argument is that uh, this populism is essentially uh, a mirage, uh, it's gonna fail to deliver. Uh, as I've described before, it creates vulnerabilities, both foreign and domestic, uh, that are gonna be major challenges for our country. 
And at the end of the day, those who uh, supported populists are going to uh, move away from that frustrated uh, and disconnected even more from their political system. So uh, it's at the end of the day fundamentally going to fail and not continue. Jamie, thank you. It's a very thoughtful conclusion. I'd ask everybody to take out their phones one last time. And speaking of engagement, this is your chance to vote again. Um, if you have had the needle moved in your mind, uh, please vote with how you've been persuaded. If you double down on what you came in here and understood, please continue to vote the same. Uh, it is your opportunity to vote to reflect the thoughts of the panel. If any specific debater changed your mind and you want to comment inside the app, there's all kinds of opportunities in the activity stream to continue the conversation. I know there are a handful of hands that didn't get called on. Uh, there's a lot to consider here, and I would love to read those uh, later today. Has everyone been able to access the app and vote again? See, look, your voice is being heard. <laughs> Wait, uh, excuse me, what does the winner get? A cake. <laughs> a cake will be delivered to the University of Washington <laughs> with Professor Christopher Parker. <laughs> We're going to call it last call for votes. Last call for votes. Did everybody get their vote in? Or there's a rise of apathy, just Backing like Jamie away. said. Oh. That's what I heard. That's what I'm seeing. It's not a representative system. It's not a representative system. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm I'm a Gen Xer, which means I grew up without technology. I still speak analog, but I understand that it that digital has failings. So. Uh, currently, what is the reflection in the voting? Different results. What? What? I'm from Florida, so I have no business doing a recount. No, don't, gonna... don't, 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 <laughs> don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a little improv here. Yes, and is the rule of improv, right? Yes, and continues the conversation. M I'm going to attempt to offer a conclusion here based on what we've heard while we wait for the, the digital to work. And if not, I think there's a lot of things to consider. I, one of the most important things I heard from this side of the room, um, Professor Graffy, there's an optimism. And I think it's very important. Uh, this, this woman in the front row had a very thoughtful question and sort of framed it in the perspective of populism as pessimism or optimism, this idea that we, we want thoughtful leaders, we want dynamic leaders, we want an explainer in chiefs, we want people that, that can bring complicated solutions to complex problems. We don't want to be um, fed junk food and ear candy. And I think that's something very um, interesting to think about. Uh, Jamie had a lot of pragmatic, uh, reasonable uh, approaches to things. From this side, I think there's uh, been a lot of discussion around complexities in, in populism that are beyond what we understand. Something that I, I love to talk about, it's really, really um, illustrative in this example, is the six blind men and the elephant, or the six men in the dark room with the elephant. Has anyone heard of this story? You sound exhausted by it, so I'm gonna, <laughs> you can leave now. <laughs> but it's the idea that there's a dark room and there are six people with an elephant and they can only understand what they can touch so it's in their sphere. And on the front, someone says, an elephant is, is this large, leathery snake that floats in the air. And the person next to them can only touch the ear says, no, it's this giant leather fan. And the person next to them has a tusk says, what are you talking about? It's polished in wood and tapered. Someone next to them says, it's a palm tree with three polished stones. Just to, a little further down, someone says, it's a large, heaving wall. And on the end, someone says, it's a rope, and it really stinks. And I think that where you are when you look at how we engage has a lot to do with what you see and understand. And I know that when I walked into the room, I probably only stood, understood two or three pieces of this elephant, this non-political, non-partisan African elephant, this large animal. And I think as, a, as, an, as the opportunity to listen to thoughtful um, uh, 
uh, debate and discussion. There are thousands and thousands of hours represented on this stage that were distilled into a few minutes. And I hope that when everybody walks out of here, the conclusion is that there are cycles. We are in the middle of a rise and there is an opportunity for some calm. And right now, the more that we commit to understanding all of the parts of the elephant, the better we are to having complex and well thought out solutions to complex problems. Thank you to the panel. All right, thank you for being here. This concludes our panel. No vote, no, no following vote. <laughs> your, your cake will be delivered. Can I give you my card? Thank you. No, you did a nice job.